Good afternoon, everybody. Hi there. Here we are. We're back on the air, right? Back yes, on the we air. are on this Monday afternoon. And we're glad that all of you are with us today. Yes, we're going to resume are. our journey through Matthew, through Holy Week, um, uh, leading up to uh, Good Friday and Easter, really, is kind of where yes. we are on this. So It wasn't hope. too long after this COVID yeah. thing started that you were talking about the real Easter week. You know, I mean, because it was... Then, oh, Easter, right? ha Easter happened a month after COVID yes. started. We, could, we went inside that the first Sunday there was no church was March 15th. Right. Because 12th was a, went Thursday because we had the yes. class social up at, at uh, I don't know, what, La Hacienda. La Hacienda Grill, yes. So, what yeah, was the last time we saw we are, most of you? Middle of August. Wow. Yep, yep. So, uh, hope all of you didn't have... Uh, any damage in the storms last night? We but, did. Uh, we, we had a little, a bit. little bit. Yeah, we have some trees and we have power part, outage. Part of one window is going to have to be fixed. I'm kind of lost a little decorative plastic something. I, I don't know what it, it is. But fierce. anyway, it was fierce. And we fierce. had a, we had an adventure last night. I'm gonna let Patty tell you the story of our adventure. Okay. Go All ahead. Right. Um, well, our youngest son Robbie lives here with his wife Savannah, and they live in Dallas. And, um, you know, prior to this whole COVID thing, I had to see him like at least every other week or I didn't think I could make it, you know. But it's been six weeks since we saw Robbie and Savannah. They have been, both are still blessedly full-time employed and they have been trying really, really hard not to get COVID. So they've been staying in and they have not done a whole bunch of social things. So we decided to meet last night at six o'clock at McGuire's. Because Sunday at McGuire's, even before COVID, it's always a very quiet period. It's just it's just quiet and nice and quiet there if you're ever looking for a, a place to go. And last night we got there and Robbie and Savannah arrived a few minutes later and there were only three tables in that whole restaurant full. And we got our drinks. Fortunately, we got our drinks. Fortunately, <laughs> we got our drinks and then boom, it wasn't raining. It wasn't windy yet. All the power went out. And then we could hear all the sirens and ambulances everywhere. And before long, it started pouring. And so we stayed there for about 45 minutes right. at we, least. We enjoyed our drinks. We did. Um, Scott was kind of starving. He asked if there was anything they could give him from the kitchen. And the only thing they had was green split pea soup. So Scott ate two cups of the soup. The rest of us ate bread. Good. What can I tell you? It was good. I was hungry. <laughs> the rest it was of good. Us it, was, ate bread. it was time beat. And then they nicely kind of kicked us out of there. Yeah. They had heard that their power wasn't going to come on till about 11. Yeah. But meanwhile, then we drove all the way home. There was a lot of power, you know, on the way we could see people at lights, but ours was still out. So we pulled into our subdivision and thankfully it came on, you know, about quarter to nine. But it would have been a hot night without air conditioning. Yes, it would so have we been at that time of year. So anyway, so Scott's all trying those to convince me that this was not a bad thing because this was an adventure that we would not forget. Well, because my point was, <laughs> if we had, had met them at McGuire's at five years from now, it would not hardly be anything to remember. Right? But that now story it's... last night with the split pea soup. Yes, remember the night? <laughs> it was 107, and Scott ate yeah, some split yeah. pea soup. It was good. It was good. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, thanks for joining us thanks today. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to open us up with a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we are grateful again to be gathered back here. And I, I did get a prayer request today from Mike and Brandy Graham to lift up their daughter, Maylin, who is um, heading off to UNT. And, and really, they give voice to so many parents of college students who are heading off in the midst of COVID, high school Parents who have high school kids, middle school kids, elementary kids, preschool kids, everybody. There's just so much anxiety and so much concern. And we just pray that you will keep um, all of our children, all of our sons and daughters well. That you will um, help to bring everybody a lot of comfort and strength in the coming days and weeks. Um, uh, just help us continue to make our way through this very difficult time. And we pray that today as we read through Matthew some more, that you will open our hearts to you and help us to hear these sometimes familiar words in ways as, in ways we have not before. All this we pray in the great and glorious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
We also pray for all the teachers and administrators and yes, it's janitors and everybody. You can imagine how much anxiety there there is so around all of it. Yeah, like I said, I, I wouldn't want to be a school administrator or something these days trying to make decisions. But we're glad that you're here on this Monday afternoon as we resume our trip through Matthew. And where we are in Matthew is in um, chapter 22, um, verse 15. So we are in the midst of a day of confrontations. The way Matthew cast it is it's this huge long day many many things happen all of them really centered on the growing confrontation between Jesus and his principal opponents Pharisees Sadducees the scribes the priests the Herodians um, not not really the common masses but all the all the leaders of Israel who should who really should know better, um, who should be able to grasp that indeed God has kept his promises um, in the form of Jesus Christ. So, um, we are at 22, chapter 22, verse 15, and it's just one little test after another. So, uh, so here is the next one. This is right right where we dropped, stopped last week. Um, let me... I did bring a few images today. This is the map I am using for now for Jerusalem and Jesus' day, just to uh, uh, refresh your memory. The white arrow is pointing toward the Temple Mount. The large structure in the middle is the Temple proper. Um, And this is that model in Jerusalem. And you can see the large colonnade on one end with the red roof um, and those are just all areas where there would be shade um, and people would would gather there during the heat of the day and all of these confrontations that we're reading about in Matthew 22 are happening in one day and they're all happening in the temple courtyards somewhere up there somewhere here um, uh, somewhere up on this gigantic temple mount which as i said last week is enormous um it is you could fit maybe 22 football fields on it it's just just gigantic but so they're in various places and jesus is probably sitting down and he is being accosted by these these various folks who are his opponents so look at verse 15 So the Pharisees went out and they laid plans to trap Jesus in his own words because they have concluded that they want to be rid of him. And they don't don't like that the masses are responding to Jesus and they're listening to him and they're seeing what he does. And so they want to trap him and they want to, uh, you know, um, knock knock him down really figuratively speaking and we'll see what that leads to verse 16 so the pharisees sent their disciples and their disciples disciple is a word that just means well typically we think of it as meaning student but a better word is apprentice they sent their apprentices their disciples to jesus along with the herodians these would be Jew, jews who were comfortable with Um, the rule of of the Herods and just more of the leadership, the wealthy class, the learned class who are opposing Jesus. So teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Now, let me just tell you, that whole bit just makes me gag. Just makes me gag. They're not sincere. They don't really think he's a man of integrity and you te- that teaches the way of God in accordance with the truth. They're trying to lay a trap. They're trying to lay out some honey there around them all so that they can try to lure Jesus in like a little, like a little insect or something that they could trap in the honey and then pounce on him so sure this is this is dripping in insincerity there's nothing to this part in the gospel which would indicate anything else so yeah they're not sincere so they say you aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are tell us then and here's the trap 
Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? And they think that, man, oh man, they have got him now. And let me tell you why. First of all, there's a long history of tax revolts in Judea and Galilee because the Jews chafed under the fact that they had to pay taxes to their pagan oppressors. So the way that you could always get yourself on the side of the common people was to, you know, tell them don't pay your taxes. We don't, don't have to pay that to these pagans. Don't pay your taxes. And, and um, when Jesus was about 10 years old or so, there was a tax revolt in Sepphoris, which was a large city in one of the largest cities in Galilee, about four miles from Nazareth. And um, the Romans put down the revolt, of course, burned half the city, crucified several thousand Galileans on the roadsides in, in, in Galilee. And <clears throat> that was all because um, uh, Judas the Galilean had come um, leading the people in this tax revolt because taxes weren't popular. So that's one side of it. The common people don't want to pay their taxes, really, who does? The other side of it, of course, there is Rome, who wants the taxes collected. So they think they've got Jesus trapped, because if he says, pay your taxes, that'll, that'll anger the common folk who are following him, and, and uh, right? Okay. And if he says, don't pay your taxes, well, then the Roman authorities will come down on him. So both are bad outcomes for Jesus. He, there's no reason he wants to anger the, the people who have been following him around um, and hearing him preach and teach and seeing his miracles. And there's no way that he wants to have the Romans come down, come down on him. Who would? Who would? So here's what he says. 18. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, so all the little honey words that they spread out, you know, that didn't make any difference to Jesus. He knows what they're about. Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites! Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. Well, at that moment, I bet it got really, really quiet. He said, Show me the coin used for paying the tax, and somebody brought him a denarius. Now, a denarius, very common coin, represented basically a day's wages. And I have an image here, a photo of a coin from that time. This is a denarius coin from Jesus' time. This was minted um, in France, um, by the Romans during the reign of Tiberius. Tiberius was the second Caesar. There was the first Caesar was Augustus, followed by Tiberius, followed by Caligula, followed by Claudius, who kicked um, the Jews and Christians out of Rome in 50 AD, and then followed by Nero, who was the last of the of that particular dynasty. So this is the coin, very typical of the coins of that time and this is the coin that somebody's going to pull out of his wallet or his pocket or his purse and show to Jesus. So the first thing you want to notice on it, whose who's big head do you think that is? Caesar's. That's Caesar's head. What did God say about making graven images? Mm -hmm. Book of Exodus, Deuteronomy, the Jews were not to make graven images. Everybody else did, but when you look at the architectural and, and art such as it was of the Jews, it was always geographical shapes or maybe, you know, uh, stylized plants or palms or something, but never, never people because of the commandment to not make graven images. They just stayed away from, of God, they stayed away from them entirely. So here's a graven image on this coin of Tiberius, and though it doesn't claim it on this coin, there were other coins that would say something like Tiberius, um, Savior, Tiberius, Son of God, because the um, emperor cult was growing at the time. 
And on the reverse side of the coin, that lady you see there is probably, that not everybody agrees who she is, but she's probably um, Livia, um, the goddess of peace. And it, the words there that you might be able to make out are, are basically Pontus Maximus. Pontus Maximus, because Caesar was not only the head of state, he was the head of um, uh, the religion. It was a very, you know, large conglomerated religion, but still, he was like the chief priest of Rome, as well as being the, the chief of state. So they go in and they pull out this denarius. It's got a graven image on it to a man who is worshipped. Oh, that's not good. And they bring it to Jesus, right? They bring it to Jesus, verse 20, and he asks them, well, whose image is this? And whose inscription is it? And they said, Caesar's. So he said to them, all right, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. They left him and went away. You bet they went away. They went away with their heads bowed, their tail between their legs. They were thought they were so clever. They were going to trap Jesus. Now, let's talk about this. Render unto Caesar what's Caesar and unto God what, what's God's. People kind of hearing this, some kind of separation of church and state thing. No. <laughs> separation of church and state is a very modern invention. Very modern invention. Okay, that has nothing to do with here. The challenge here is, is this. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Hard for Caesar to argue with that, right? On the surface of it. But what would every Jew be ready to profess? Ah, what is not God's? What is not God's? It's very clever. Very, very wise response. Just the best way out of this trap that I could imagine. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's to God, what is God's, indeed what is not God's. So there you go. So he manages to basically call the people to God and not anger the Romans all at the same time. So no surprise then that the fair that these his opponents are amazed and they left and they went away. For a while. So, any questions about that marvelous little bit? No, no one, okay. no questions over here. All right, we'll go on to the next marvelous little bit then. I need to give you back a little bit of background for this. Okay, so it's fair to say that most of the Jews of Jesus' day believed that when God finally kept his promises, did his big thing, raised up a Messiah, um, renewed the cosmos, kept all those great promises um, from Isaiah and the rest of the prophets, that they believed that the dead would be resurrected. That their long dead ancestors would get to participate in this. And all of the people would be resurrected bodily. Which helps to explain why they buried people as they did. Because... As you know, they didn't really bury them in the ground. Okay? We'll talk about that in a few weeks when, when we get there, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about. So they believed that all the dead would be resurrected. In my Sunday class next Sunday, we're going to trace a few of these steps in terms of the Jewish belief in resurrection, which which goes back hundreds of years before Jesus. It was a... a, a um, wasn't always an idea that the Jews held, but it, it grew to be one. And by Jesus' day, most did, except for the Sadducees. We don't know much about the Sadducees, really. Um, what we do know about them is that they were the wealthy, upper middle class, upper class among the Jews. Um, they were um, quite happy with the status quo. They've got the big houses, the fancy cars, the 4K TVs, the nice trips, whatever you would think. And our culture is represents a lot of material success 
in worldly power. That's what the Sadducees had back in this day. And so they were comfortable with the Romans. So consequently, because resurrection implies the arrival of God's big day and the world being turned upside down where the poor are lifted up and the rich are brought low, well, the Sadducees didn't want to have anything to do with it. So the Sadducees did not believe in the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. Pharisees did strongly. Sadducees did not. And it's really just because if you're on top of the world, do you want the world turned upside down? I jokingly put it this way. I'm pretty sure that four days before Super Bowl Sunday, a lot of Christian guys, if they were told that Jesus would be, was about to come back, they would say, well, could you just wait till Monday after the Super Bowl? I say it jokingly. I'm not so sure that's even, that's not even so, Patty. But anyway, so the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection of the dead, and they are going to come with that to challenge Jesus because he is, he preaches the resurrection of the dead. Of course he does. He is confident in his way that, that, that he will be resurrected. So, let's look at verse 23. That same day, this is all in Matthew, it's all probably like Tuesday or so. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection of the dead, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. True. It's called leveret marriage. It was a way to ensure that the widows found a household to be part of. It was also a way to keep uh, um, the dead brother's um, property intact. It was a way to keep the family's property intact. It was a way to ensure a bloodline for the brother because uh, for the dead brother because um, the the widow and her new husband when they had a child the child would actually be legally the child of the dead brother all complicated all to say this is quite typical it's the way they did it um, and uh, in the day of Moses and so forth so 25 now there were seven brothers among us the first one married and died, and since he, he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, Jesus, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Hmm. Seven husbands waiting for her. Whose wife will she be? It's pretty much a question I've been asked a few times in my classes over the years. Um, and maybe a little different form, but kind of the same thing. Hmm, you might hmm. have even asked God about that. Yes, for because <laughs> obviously those of you who don't know our story know that Patty's first husband, Gary, died of cancer at 37. And Patty remarried, and she remarried B. So it might be natural for us to ask, well... You know, when we're all resurrected, who's Patty going to be married to, Gary or to me? We'd both want her. Oh, yes. Right, honey? <laughs> we and probably lots of other guys up there. <laughs> oh, you're crazy. Okay. Verse 29. Here's Jesus' answer. You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Okay, so that's the first thing he says. And when we are resurrected, marriage isn't part of it. So the woman isn't the husband, isn't the wife of any of those dead husbands who have been resurrected. And... Um, marriage and, and appears to be a part of this world, but not a part of um, the consummated kingdom of God. Verse 31, but about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. 
He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Meaning that, you know, um, death is not something that, that Jesus wants to talk about. It is about it is about the living. It is about resurrection. And I think that's that's a bit that that's the Bible. I mean, that's the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't it says almost nothing about the time between our deaths and our resurrection. Almost nothing. Yeah, there's two or three places we we could talk about, uh, but what the Bible wants to talk about is God keeping His promises and our resurrection, which is what we're talking about. Some on in my Sunday class at eleven o'clock. That resurrection is the big, big promise. It is the promise that I will hug my mom again, not just sit next to her as some sort of you know non-material being singing hymns or listening to it. But no, I will hug my mom again someday. I will hug my granddad again someday. That's the promise. That's what the Jews hung on to. It's what it's what we should be hanging on to. And so Jesus says he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the giver of life. He's the keeper of life. He is the sustainer of life. Dot, dot, dot. Quit trying to trap me. <laughs> well, Verse 33, when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at Jesus' teachings. Because no matter who comes to him, he sends them away, right? Having basically, um, with a forthright statement about Scripture, about God, he speaks with authority. That's the secret of the Sermon on the Mount. The secret of the Sermon on the Mount is to understand that Jesus is speaking with authority about the nature of the kingdom of God. And here, he speaks with authority. And so they are, they are astonished, not just at the content of what he said, they're astonished at the authority with which he says it to the Pharisees, to the Sadducees, to whoever comes to him. He is authoritative in what he does. He, he speaks, like in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, he speaks with the authority of Moses and more. Okay? So, anybody got anything over there, honey? No, don't, hon. Okay. I guess you're explaining it really clearly. I'll add one aside. You know, I'm sometimes asked about Mormonism. You know, Mormonism is not a Christian denomination. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is an entirely different religion. It's not Christian. It is Mormonism. And one of the um, ways Mormonism doctrinally differs from Christianity is that in Mormonism, the marriage is for all eternity with the goal of one time being spirit father and spirit mother of their own planet and having their own spirit children and all this other stuff. But it's, 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 it's not what Jesus teaches here. It also, what Jesus teaches here reminds us that just as God isn't a better version of ourselves, the kingdom of God is not just a better version of this place. It's not just this place where everybody gets along. It's it's more than that. It's different than that. It's a little bit like Arthur's sermon, you know. What it what was it? You can't always get what you want, but sometimes you get something better. That was this week's ser last sermon. Yeah. So I think Christian churches have done a very poor job of helping us to grasp the wonder and grandeur of God's promises. And and we shortchange ourselves. And we we end up not not reading the Bible well and not hearing God well in this. So I'm not gonna go on a long rant. Because now we get to come to verse thirty four. He says this, he rubs his hands together. Yes, this is good stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna, it's going to be hard for me not to preach this. I'm just, just warning you. Okay, Patty, you got anything? 
Nope. Okay, we're, good. we're bring going. It. We're rolling. Bring, bring it. <laughs> bring it on, Pastor Scott. Bring it. Okay, so hearing that Jesus said silence the Sadducees, and the Pharisees got together. They're going to come back again. They, it's like they left the ring, straightened themselves up, had a drink, splashed water in the face, and now they're going to climb back in one more time with Jesus. One of them, an expert in the law, a lawyer, tested, tested Jesus. Tested Jesus. Just the sheer arrogance of this. Jesus' ministry has been going on for two and a half or three years. And these people think that they should come forward and test him. They're going to test him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? The law of Moses. And Jesus replied, such a, this is such a straightforward response. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Basically, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The second, the, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19, 18, verse 40. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So, the two great commandments, according to Jesus himself, who is a full revelation of God. What does God want from us, hope for us above all else? That we would, one, love God, and that we would, two, love neighbor. The horizontal I've, I've seen this time where you have a heck cross in mind. The horizontal on the cross and the vertical on the cross. Love the Lord with all, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So, he says in verse 40 that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. What does he mean? Here's, I'll tell you what he means. Think of the, think of the tablets of the Ten Commandments. These foundational, the, the Ten Commandments are what begins the presentation of the law in the book of Exodus. And there are two tablets. And on the first tablet is about our love of God. That we are not to take the Sabbath, we are to respect the Sabbath, we are to respect God's name, we are not to chase after other gods, right? Um, the second tablet, if you want to think about it this way, is about loving our neighbor. Honor your parents. Um, don't covet what your neighbor has. Don't murder your neighbor. <laughs> don't steal from your neighbor. So you basically have two tablets, one that is focused upon God, one that is focused upon others. And those expressions of the law are what it means to love. To love someone is to not steal from them. Not to covet what they have. It's, it's not to lie about them or to dishonor your parents. Um, and then all the rest of the law, all of the book of Exodus, the pieces of it you get it, the, in the book of Leviticus, the restatement of it all in Deuteronomy, it's all concrete expressions of what it means to either love God or to love your neighbor. And I've used on my classes many, many times I need to come up with another favorite example, but I guess it would this one wouldn't be my favorite then. Where the law says, if you find your enemy's oxen tied to a tree, take it to them. Take the animal to your enemy. Well, who does that? It would be like saying, if you find your most bitter enemy's wallet, take it to him with the cash in it. That is what love is. It's all these little expressions of what it means to love someone. Or to love God. And so if you took it, another way I've taught this is if you take all of the law, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you take all of it and you put it in one of those big cast iron pots and you start to boil it down until you're left with only the essence of it, the purest essence of it. What would be left? What would it all boil down to? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And it's just vastly important in your sort of understanding of Scripture 
an understanding of who God is and who we are to grasp that these two commandments are not invented by Jesus. He is restating two fundamental teachings from um, uh, the law of Moses, a time, a millennium and a half before Jesus. Deuteronomy 6.4, Leviticus 19.18. Um, we're going to talk in my Sunday class, we're going to talk about this a little bit because one way to diagnose what is going wrong in our culture is that for a long time, we have a lot of, not all of our culture, but a lot of the culture has tried to live out what Jay Budashevsky called the second tablet project. Let me explain. They, We've been trying to live out keeping the second tablet about our neighbor and ignoring the first. Keeping the second tablet, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, all the rest of it, while ignoring and not caring about loving God, thinking that you could love your neighbor without first loving God, and that project is falling apart. The second tablet project is falling apart in front of our eyes. Just falling apart in front of our eyes. You you, it is that underlying confidence in a creator who tells you what's right or wrong with all of the attendant difficulties of interpretation. All the grayness that might exist in I get all that. But if you don't have a creator outside ourselves, outside humanity, who who helps us understand what is right and what is wrong, what is loving and what is not loving, then you're merely left to ourselves and it all becomes an exercise in power, in riots and bullets and, and, and there you go. So in my class on Sunday, we're actually going to talk about this a little bit because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big part, I think, of understanding why um, hope is can be hard to find these days. So, big, um, this passage in Matthew is pretty short. It's very direct. It's, what, six verses, 34 to 40. Boom, boom, boom. A little more time is taken in the other Gospels, but the point's the same. The greatest commandments, one and two, they go together. Okay. So, anything over there? No. Nope. <laughs> I'll let you know. Okay. All righty. People do want you to bring it on, though, honey. Yeah, well, Preach we're trying. We're doing our best here. <laughs> <laughs> I think you miss being up there on Sunday yeah, mornings. Yeah, yeah, sometimes I need, the, you know, the full full platform, I guess, once in a while. I don't yeah. know. But it's you just, know, you know, it's just, it's just that almost, you know, I went to church virtually my entire life. I was an acolyte in the Episcopal Church, got married young, joined the Methodist Church because she was my my wife was a first wife was a Methodist. Went to church, sang in the choir, and I'm telling you what I basically heard all that time was Jesus forgives you, and I just try to be a better person. And there were all these stories that some of them were inspiring and some of them weren't, but nothing approached actually talking about transformation about the renewing of our minds and hearts about taking off the old clothes and putting on new and all this stuff that the new testament jesus and paul and the rest want to talk about i i don't know it was just i i, I don't think i was alone in not hearing it and not getting it so i'm am on man on a mission now to Help us see, see, see more in in these gospels than just just the surface. The the surface is wonderful. I get that, but boy, is there a lot more here. Okay, so okay, so this next part this will be a, this is a little more challenging, maybe. Verse forty one. While the Pharisees were gathered together, G oh, I do have an image here. Let me do that. Wait, real quick. What did I bring? I brought something here. I should look at my own notes. <laughs> I, I think this is James to sow again. 
I believe. And this is Jesus under a tree. I don't know if there were trees had it been planted anywhere in the, on the Temple Mount, but maybe there were. But anyway, who cares? He's under a tree, and you see him sitting there with some of his disciples, and he's teaching, and he's being accosted. You can see the aggressive stance of the one man talking to him um, as he is talking with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the rest. Okay? So... While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, Well, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Well, they answered, That's an easy question. The son of David, of course. Of course. And he said to them, Well then, how is it that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do is to turn to Psalm 110. I think I'm going to do it in my little NRSV actual Bible here, as opposed to finding it on my iPad. Psalm 110, it's a short psalm. It's a messianic psalm. It talks about the son of David. And by Jesus' day, the Jews had accepted and, and believed that the Messiah would, you know, would be a son of David. It's kind of what it's all about. The Messiah is a righteous king um, in the line of David. So here's Psalm 110. My subnote here um, says, Assurance of victory for God's priest king. So, verse 1, Yahweh, that, remember to look at the Lord, if you're there with me, 110, verse 1, the Lord, the small caps, Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord says to my Lord, this is David. So, actually, what is he saying? The Lord says to who? To himself? The Lord says to David's Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Because the my Lord, the my is David. This is a psalm of David, so the my is him. So David writes, Yahweh says to my Lord, to David's Lord. Well, who is David's Lord? That's what I'm... It's kind of enigmatic, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. Who is his Lord? I would have thought it was God. But then it would be. But then it wouldn't make. Then this no, doesn't make any God sense. To my God. Which hmm. doesn't even make. Why would God have to talk to himself? So he always says to my Lord. So who is David's Lord? Ah. Well, once you ask that question, you're kind of off to the races, then, right? Who is David's Lord? That's what Jesus is talking about. How could David's son be David's Lord? How could the Messiah be David's Lord? Who is David's Lord, actually, honey, in the bigger scheme of things? God. God. Sure, God. So, who is the Messiah then? God. Jesus. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Jesus takes this little psalm with its messianic sense to it and uses it to shape around himself in this way that I'll bet most of the people there don't quite get, because, you know, we have the benefit, benefit of living after all of this. Um, and that he is the son of David slash Messiah, and he is, Jesus is David's Lord, which would get into the whole God thing. The Lord said to my Lord, so he says, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? See, so they, they say to David, well, the Messiah is the son of David. And then Jesus says, well, how, why would David call his son his Lord? Because Jesus is actually not merely Messiah. He isn't merely David's son. He is God. Who came riding into Jerusalem that day? A few days before this. 
Palm Sunday. Who rides into Jerusalem? Yes, it's Jesus. And he wraps himself in all the messianic, you know, demonstrations that he can. So he rides in as Messiah, rides in as king. But who was always to, supposed to be the king of Israel? Going back to the book of Joshua and the book of Judges. Who was Israel's king? God was Israel's king, right? No king but God. No king but God. Remember the bumper sticker on, yes. on everybody's cart? Yes. In the first century. No king but God, right? Because right. if, see, this is where knowing your Old Testament is helpful because when the Israelites leave Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments by Moses, and they eventually get to the Promised Land, and then they go in and they start conquering, they don't have a human king. Even when they begin to settle in the land, um, disputes are arbitrated by people they call judges. They don't have a human king. God was to be their king. God was their king. Until you come to the time of Samuel when the people began to demand a human king like everybody else had. And God even says to Samuel, Oh, Samuel, don't you take it personally. Don't take it personally. They're mad at me, God. They're mad at me. So I'm going to give them what they want. So God does. God gives, give, gave them what they wanted. And they got Saul. And then they got David. And then they got Solomon. And they got a long string of kings. Most of them pretty terrible thereafter. But God was to be their king. So I ask you again, on Palm Sunday, when Jesus comes riding in, who is riding in? The Lord. The Lord is riding in. God is riding in. Yahweh, John's Gospel does this explicitly. Yahweh is returning to Zion. Jesus is not merely Messiah. He is God. And I don't really know that day how many of the, I don't think many, I don't think the Pharisees could have really worked this out because they're before the crucifixion and resurrection. Sure. Yes. Right? Yes. So, but that is clearly what Jesus is doing. Well. It, it's interesting in my, um, <laughs> My NIV here, both the Lord, the first the Lord said to my Lord, it's all written without the little like Yahweh. Because in your New Testament, you don't find that. Because remember, the small caps Lord is is under, underneath it in the Hebrew is the name of God. So that's never the case in the New Testament because there is no Hebrew in the New Testament. So you, right. yeah, so you have to go back yes. to Psalm 110, yeah. and then that makes it clear, because yes. then you see it's Yahweh, it is the Yahweh, Yahweh said to my Lord, and then it all becomes clear, right? Right. Yeah. So I know this is kind of just a guess, but David was so prolific in writing all these beautiful Psalms. Do we know, have any clue, were these all... Like while well, he was king, or after oh, God had anointed him, they were at different times. They were at different times, and sometimes you get a little heading that tells you when it was. For example, there's one in particular, Psalm 51, I think, written by David after his sin with Bathsheba, and after being confronted by Nathan. Okay. And it's this great psalm of repentance. So they're written at different times, and sometimes we get clues about when they happen. And not all the psalms are written by David, but the ones that are usually say a psalm by David. That's really the only way we know, because otherwise, I mean, David lived well, how long ago? 3,000 years ago. Wow. 3,000 years. That is a long time. Okay, so Jesus does this whole thing with Psalm 110, and though I don't really know how many people there could put these pieces together, honestly, um... Think of Nicodemus. Nicodemus in John 3 is a Pharisee who comes to see Jesus in the night. And Jesus talks to him, and, and Nicodemus just can't understand any of it. He doesn't get it. And Jesus confronts him and says, well, how can you, a teacher of Israel, not understand these things? But I don't think they do. But nonetheless, they realize that something big happened. Because look at verse 46. No one could say a word and reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. I love that. 
<laughs> After all of this stuff, they finally decided this is just not working out for them. They're not going to try to trap them again. They're not going to ask them any more questions. They're just... What are they going to do? They're going to get them crucified, sadly. Okay. Anything else over there, Patty? We're doing well. Okay, so now, chapter 23. Chapter 23 is a long bit of preaching by Jesus against the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the priests, and the others. Okay? And a lot of this will sound a little bit familiar. But it is this long section, basically filled with warnings, uh, filling, filled with judgment, um, pronounced by Jesus against these people. So I'm going to suggest that what we do is we just plunge in and we see how far we get in the time we have left. Okay, chapter 23, verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples. So it's always important to notice to whom he's speaking. Jesus is still teaching publicly. Chapter 23 is the last of his public teachings. After this, there's no more public teachings. Anything he says is to his disciples. But now he's speaking to the crowds and to his disciples. And he says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. I, I can just see it. They're all feeling pretty good. Pretty, right? Yeah. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. I brought you a photograph of a phylactery. You see that little box on this guy's, on this fellow's forehead? That's a phylactery. It had um, the words of the Shema, I think it's a Shema, in there. Um, love the heart, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And because if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want, if you're energetic still at 353, you could turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 23. I hope I have that right. Definitely Deuteronomy 6. <laughs> I have to put on. Okay. Just look at if you re, hope you turned with me, really, because this. Look at Deuteronomy six, verse four. This this is the greatest commandment from Jesus. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you are away from home. When you And when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise, bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Thus the phylacteries. So it was in verse 23. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So this, this rabbi here is exactly literally doing that. He is literally wearing them on his forehead. And if you were to watch, we, Patty and I, not too long ago, watched the movie Ben-Hur. And, of course, in that movie, Charlton Heston, of all people, is playing a Jewish man named... Ben Hur, Joshua Ben Hur. And every time he goes in and out the front door of his residence, there's a little box there in which he, he keeps, in which the, the little Shema would be written in there, Deuteronomy 6 4. 
and he would touch it every time he walked past. It was this literal keeping of the law and honoring God's word. But look back at Matthew 23 now. I'll give you a second to get back there. Verse 5, everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide. So it's a big old box they wear on their forehead. Why would you wear a big old box? Everybody can see. Everybody can see just how righteous and devout and pious a man you really are. And the tassels on their garments long. Uh, the law has a couple of places where they're told to wear ta four tassels on their garment. Um Again, as a reminder of who they are and, and, and the law. So if you make the tassel long, and may, in the Hebrew it might be wide, real long, again, what are you doing? Look at me. Look at me. I got long tassels and I got a wide phylactery <laughs> on my forehead. They, verse 6, they love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. They just love it all. They just soak it up. It's just it's so wonderful to them. Oh, man. You start to read this and you understand how Jesus ends up on a cross a few days later, don't you? I hope you do. Yes, you do. <coughs> Because in his sights are the leaders of Israel, all the people with power. Some because of money, some because <coughs> of the respect in which they are held. Okay, so verse 8. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. Don't call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, the world turned upside down. People who are on top of the world don't want the world turned upside down. They don't want the exalted to be humbled. That's turning the world upside down. But this is all so Jesus, right? The Pharisees and the rest of them, they're all about gathering honor to themselves and they, they you know, enjoy the deference they're given, the respect in which they are held. The fact that they get the best seats and when they come into the room, everybody stands and makes room for them. They get the best, they get the best snacks and cocktails. And I don't know. Yeah, that's what they like. They are they like all the honor that comes with their office and their work. And Jesus is just saying, no, 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 no. That is not what you're here for. God is your teacher. You need to embrace humility. And this, you know, we sort of hear this in our culture, okay? And living it out in our culture is like really difficult. But this is an honor and shame culture, which means that their culture is a culture in which everything is driven by the gathering of honor and the avoidance of shame. That's a common Mediterranean culture. Gathering together honor and avoiding shame and, and um, their desire to be honored and deferred to has just led them completely astray. They can't even hear Jesus. They can't see him. They can't listen to him. They don't want the world turned upside down. It's, it's, you know, if, if you look through this to the, and you see real people on the other side, the real men who made up the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees and the priests, these are real flesh and blood people who are just blind to it. Um, it's, it's sad, but they don't get it. They don't get it. Um, yes, Carl Reeves pointed out that they were virtue signaling. That's a very modern word, word, is it, right? People do things so that you can really grasp just how virtuous a person they are. That is the way of the Pharisees and the rest of them. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. Jesus would be saying, stop signaling your virtue and just live it out. 
quietly, not for everybody to see, but so that you and your maker will, will know that you did right. All right, friends. Verse 13. Now we have woes. <laughs> there are various kinds of woes. These woes are judgment woes. These are woes are Thelma and Louise, your car is flying off the cliff, cliff sort of woes. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom in people's faces. You yourselves don't enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. You see, they, not only are they missing the, the kingdom of heaven, but they are keeping other people out. They're leading Israel astray. This is such a big Old Testament theme. In the Old Testament, the kings were supposed to be shepherds, good shepherds who led their people toward God. But now these people who should be the shepherds, they are the shepherds of Israel. They're just bad shepherds. They're leading people away from the kingdom of God in their rejection of Jesus. Verse 15, woe to you. I like saying that. <laughs> I should try that outside somewhere. I don't even go outside anymore. <laughs> woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. Probably having in mind Gentiles, some who, who become embrace Judaism and when you have exceeded you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are whoa <laughs> oh man so what's he saying you go and you get these you get these people to come in to to entertain the notion of being among the actual people of God and what do you do you wreck them just like you've wrecked yourselves and you wreck everything else you're leading them away from the kingdom uh, of God It's just, you know, we live in a world in which a lot of people think none of this stuff actually matters very much. It's all, I, it's all just a little private spiritual thing. You know, your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. You know, yeah, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter that much. That is not Jesus. And, and. I, again, go back to my own experience over the last six decades of hearing sermons and grasping some of it, I, I never can remember getting much of a sense of confrontation, of light and darkness. But that is clearly a huge theme that cuts across the whole all cuts across the gospels this does matter what could matter more than embracing the one who was with god and was god how what could be what could be more important than that of course it matters it matters more than anything else in this world but that isn't a message a lot of people want to hear anymore but it's clearly when you come to the Bible and you just kind of do what we do here which you start at verse 1 in Matthew and you work all your way through to the end it's kind of a hard thing to miss a child of hell the man was direct I'll tell you verse 16 woe to you blind guides I mean I've traveled I think we might have had a blind guide once or twice Patty don't you think maybe not in Israel, though. Not in Israel. no not no Israel. not in Israel I can think of a couple I can think of one in France but anyway who wants a blind guide what's the point of that woe to you blind guides same thing as saying what are you crummy shepherds woe to you blind guides you say if anyone swears by the temple it means nothing but anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath you blind fools which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, 
Which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Um, oath taking was common in Judaism at this time, um, and Jesus is is um, well. I'm, I don't want to race to the end. Let's just get to the end before I say that. You blind men. In verse 19, you blind men, which is greater, the gift of the altar that makes a gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. So, okay. That whole paragraph poses a couple of challenges. The first one is, Jesus says at another time, I think something that is closer um, to what he would say to you and me, is that let your yes be yes and your no be no. That this business of having to swear an oath on everything was, was really not the way that God would have us live. God would just have us live lives of radical honesty, our no's be no and our yeses be yeses. But what Jesus has in view here is probably not that large a question. It is the oath-taking taught by the Pharisees and the emphasis upon money and upon gifts and upon gold. And that, that none of that counts for anything in this. That when you swear by the altar, where you swear by the temple, you are actually swearing by God himself. Because it's God's temple, and it's God's altar. And in, But swearing even by God, maybe in some way, you could view it as trying to obligate God to something pulling God into your truth keeping or or not and I think it's why Jesus says elsewhere you know don't just let your yes be yes and, and your no be no which I think is much more fitting for you know the body of Jesus' teachings so let's do at least one more woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites. Don't I say each one begins the same way. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Verse 23. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. You go get them out of your little spice garden in your backyard. And you give a tenth of your spice garden to God. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. <clears throat> you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Okay, so notice, he isn't saying don't tithe. What he's saying is tithe. But more important are justice, mercy, and faithfulness. This is a huge Old Testament theme. <coughs> Going back to what is many Christians' life verse, you know, from the book of Micah, 700 years before Jesus. 700 years before Jesus. Micah wrote um, on you know God's word that what God wants from us is not rivers of oil or the sacrifice of our firstborn or whatever God wants from us is to love mercy, to do justice, and to walk humbly with God. This is this is Jeremiah. This is you name it. These are the prophets. This is God's word. But God wants is justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And yes. Jesus says, keep up your tithe. The Pharisees' problem is they think they satisfy the law when they pay their tithe, but then they go on to neglect justice and neglect mercy and faithfulness. And so in verse 24, he says, You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. I love that. You strain out a nap but swallow a camel, which means you just, they've been focusing on all these little things. 
They're not bad things. They're good things. But neglecting all the stuff that really matters. It doesn't make the little things bad things. The little things are still good things. They're important things. They're necessary things. But they're neglecting what the much bigger questions of justice, mercy, kindness, compassion, faithfulness. And, and in so doing, they are neglecting the biggest of all, which is Jesus. They don't even see that the gates of the kingdom are lie right before them in the person of Jesus. So when we come back next week, we are going to uh, finish up the woes and then we will be into Matthew 24 which I'll just give you a hint um, it is it's called Jesus' Discourse on the Mount of Olives and it's very challenging um, and it can be misread easily um, to be only about the quote end times Jesus' second coming but it's not about that um, it really encompasses chapters 24 and 25 so we will sort of work through that and um, I think it will be I think it will be helpful I know it will be so with that I'm going to ask Miss Patty to come over here and Scott at, at the very end there Brenda Dean did mention that there are the three woes the woes of Babylon in, in Revelation, Revelation. And uh, probably if I pulled up my concordance, I'd find, I bet there's some woe, woe passages in the Old Testament as well. So, yeah, it's kind of a Jewish thing. I kind of like it, though. Oh, I can, th I can think saying. of a couple of people over my life I could have said, woe to you. <laughs> <laughs> Not many. Just a few. Nobody, on, nobody watching right now. Yeah. Just in case you're wondering. Yeah, but you don't know if there's somebody else out there that wanted uh, to say woe to you oh man oh well let's hope not uh, i don't know there's uh nice thought today oh thanks I like the orange thanks looks good thank you probably comes across real, real well on across the airwaves orangey orangey <laughs> <laughs> patty orangey day <laughs> thank you all for um joining with us today taking the time out of your day please close with us in prayer and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow at 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock, Genesis. Ah, tomorrow, not only are we, we finishing up Jacob's ladder, but we are coming to the love story of Jacob, Jacob and Rachel and the baby-making competition between Rachel and her sister. Yes. And wow. it's good stuff. 12 noon tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Jacob had to pay for stealing that birthright. He did. And oh, yeah, he's had to, he had to hurry. He had to run away from home, and you'll see what happens. But, I mean, you know, his life doesn't isn't, like, super easy. Oh, he no. He got away oh, with no. that, but there are consequences. There are a lot of twists and turns along that Jacob path, aren't it. there? Yeah, oh, yeah. There are. All righty. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day today. We thank you, God, for gathering us all together again to talk about Jesus and your word in Matthew. It's amazing how far we've come in this book many months already that we have been studying your word and really hopefully for all of us understanding it just a little bit better we pray God that you would be with us tonight and tomorrow as we live out our days and we pray God for each one of us here our families and our loved ones we pray God that you would watch over us Hold us close to you. Keep us safe, Lord. Keep us healthy. Help us do the things, God, that we know we should be doing and avoiding the things that we shouldn't, just like Paul said. It's hard. It's hard someday. Um, just is. And we ask for your help, God, with that. We pray, God, for all those that are in this group that may have concerns on their heart. Um, both concerns and some joys and we know that some people are going through some serious illnesses right now and, and having to make big decisions God regarding their care we lift each one of them up to you God we pray for their doctors we pray for their teams that will be working with them and um, Lord we just we just thank you for this day we are so grateful for it please keep us close until tomorrow in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. And okay. Scott is doing great. I was not referring to Scott. He is really doing great. And um, we'll yeah. have another PSA soon. And I'll get nervous again because I get nervous before every single test. But it's going to be it's going to be really good. I well, because it you know, should the, be. Treatment, it should the be. treatment's working. Yes. So there we go. It's a good so, thing. It sure okay, is. Okay. Adios, everybody. Bye, all. If you can, join us tomorrow. Otherwise, next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.